So as everyone comes in from the waiting room, I'm just going to do my introduction, um, which is hello and welcome to episode eight. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series, and Digging In is a series of live presentations with scholars from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And we're going to begin with a land acknowledgement for the land that the Peabody Institute and its school, Phillips Academy, are on. So Philip, Phillips Academy occupies the land of the Pen Penacook and Patuxet people and the lands of the contemporary Abenaki, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, Poconoka, and Nipmung nations. We honor all Indigenous peoples who are here now, have been here for time immemorial, and will be here in the future. We acknowledge Indigenous genocide and the continued oppression of Native peoples, voices, cultures, and spiritualities. We understand how education has been used by settler institutions in the attempted erasure of Indigenous peoples, and we commit to interrogating the histories of and our complicity in colonization, centering Native voices and communities, and dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism at Phillips Academy and beyond. So join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time through June for our presentations. For a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at peabody.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. And if you are enjoying our programming, consider expanding your impact by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. We are able to bring you outstanding programming through the support of viewers like you. And so today we are very excited to welcome Dr. Jane Baxter. Jane Eva Baxter is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois. She received her BA in Archaeological Studies and Anthropology from Boston University and her Master's and PhD in Anthropology from the University of Michigan. She is an award-winning teacher and has an extensive record of professional service. And she is the author of three books, including The Archaeology of Childhood and The Archaeology of Childhood and Adolescence in the American Experience, and is the editor slash co-editor of three volumes, including Children in Action, Perspectives on the Archaeology of Childhood and 19th Century Childhood's Interdisciplinary and International Perspectives. And she is also the author of over 30 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and many addressing issues of children and childhood in archaeology, history, and material culture. And I have loved all those books that I've read of her, so that is why I asked her to join us today. So um, I'm a little fangirling right about now for this. Um, and during and at the conclusion of the talk, viewers are able to submit questions directly to me via the Q&A function or um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen or the chat function. And we will be giving our speaker time to answer as many questions as she can with the understanding she might not get to all of them. Um, so welcome, Dr. Baxter, and thank you for joining us today. And it's childhood, and today is May the 4th be with you. So kind of perfect. It sort of is. I almost wore space buns in my hair, but I had to say no. Like, and I was thinking about channeling Leia today. Um, but thank you so much, everybody who is here and everybody who will be watching this um, in the future on YouTube. And thank you to Lindsay for organizing this and all of her hard work. We just had a delightful pre-speaker conversation. Our families are both from Gardner, Massachusetts. So I'm a Massachusetts native. I grew up in Lunenburg, but my whole family uh, is from Gardner. That's where all my roots are. So we had this fantastic as only people from Gardner with Gardner roots would have kind of conversation. Um, and as Lindsay mentioned, I went to Boston University and then I left to go to graduate school and I've been in exile in the Midwest ever since, but I miss New England and Massachusetts we miss very you much. Too. So I am delighted to be here today with all of you. And um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, and I would like to say, I really do hope that, um, well, there's a spoiler, right? Come on, we're gonna start, there we go. Um, <laughs> so not a big spoiler, but that's the last slide. So now we're here, we're at the beginning. This is an abbreviated version of a talk that I gave um, this year as an AIA speaker. So I have been um, giving this talk at 
archaeological societies around the country, and I have abbreviated it to fit the time frame of digging in. And we're going to cover a lot, a lot of ground. So um, when my 80 year old father watched this, he said, Oh, honey, that was a lot of work. And I hope no one had to take notes. You go fast. So this will go fast because I'm entertaining you today. But I would love to also um, take as many questions as you'd like. I'm used to teaching online. Um, I'm happy to answer questions from an online audience. Please do um, provide those for me. If you have any um, that come up during the talk, I'll get to them at the end. We'll do our best. So um, I want to get started by asking you all if I can get my slide to advance. Hang on. Come on. I think I'll have to use the thing at the bottom. Sorry, there we go. I'd like to start with a word association. And all I would like is for you to take a couple of seconds to think about the first few words that come to mind when you think about childhood. So if somebody says the word childhood to you or asks you about your childhood, what are some words that come to mind? And I'm gonna show you here a word cloud that I've made with a group of people who are not unlike you. Um, and these are the words that they came up with. So if you're not familiar with how word clouds work, the largest words are the ones that people said the most frequently and the smallest words are the words that got the fewest mentions. But you probably see some words that either you sort of thought about yourself in terms of a word association or that you were somewhat comfortable with um, seeing on a screen describing childhood. So um, with that in mind, let's move to my next little uh, thing here. What I'd like you to do is think a little bit about your childhood, um, some objects, events, things that typified your childhood, just the first few things that come to mind. And with that, I'm gonna take you all to the beautiful technicolor world of stock photography to see um, some of these images here. So, and some of these things probably seem somewhat familiar to you. The idea of having your own bedroom or a space or a part of a bedroom or even just a wall that you could decorate that was yours and participating in free play and organized play and playing with siblings and spending time with parents learning and learning in school. So. You know, we have this, these sort of shared um, sensibilities about childhood, even if they vary. So let me um, point out, so this is um, my slide entitled, Tell Me You Grew Up in the 70s Without Telling Me You Grew Up in the 70s. These are all pictures from my childhood. And for Lindsay, this, this one in the bottom, this is me at Lake Dunn in Gardner, Massachusetts. Um, and this is Mount Watadick, and this is in Lunenburg, and the rest are at my grandparents' uh, snowbird home in Florida. So, um, but the point is, and why I asked you all to do that, and why I'm bringing up my own childhood, is because what I want you to think Think about is the fact that any human being who is no longer a child had a childhood. So we have all had a valid, real experience of being a child. And I would say that makes childhood different than any other category of identity that archaeologists study and other social scientists. We don't have an empathetic sense of what it might be to be a member of another social class or another nationality or another ethnicity or another gender. But we all, every human, um, has had this experience throughout time. So you would think the fact that we can do this little exercise and that we can make this statement that all adult humans were once a child of some kind, um, no matter how their culture defined it, that archeologists for a long time would have been like, what a great idea, let's study children because they're everywhere, right? No matter where we look in the human past or look forward to the human future, there will be children. But the opposite is not, is exactly what archaeologists did for a long time. So traditionally, they used this empathetic understanding of childhood. Well, I know what childhood is like. And they based it on very, you know, educated Western views of childhood. I was busy learning. I was busy playing. I was busy learning to become an adult. There was nothing significant about childhood. And so they used this rhetoric to downplay the value of children as a subject of archaeology logical study. But I use this slide to point out that even these are wrong. <laughs> if you look at the world today, these are 21st century statistics, and you use some of the archaeological arguments that children didn't produce and didn't consume material culture in ways that are meaningful, that's not even true for the worlds that they're inhabiting on which they're basing these assumptions. I mean, 160 million children engaged in labor is a staggering number. $100 billion of all those gift cards and allowances and um, 
um, all of those things that children are spending is not an inconsequential part of the United States economy, right? So we can think about the fact that our assumptions may be blinding rather than enabling when we think about children in the past. The archaeology of childhood also had to fight against this idea that many archaeologists put forward that said, well, even children aren't valuable, but children also aren't visible. We can't see them. So they would create what I've referred to and others have referred to as cautionary tales that we can't sort of assume children were doing certain things because they use material culture in ways we don't expect. So here's the child who you give them a toy and they go play with the box. Or a lot of things that children play with are ephemeral. They don't survive archeologically. So things that are made of sticks and paper and leaves and you know, imaginary kind of play won't survive archeologically. And the other one was that children don't use space in ways that create patterns. They mess things up. Adults are pattern makers, children are mess makers. The archaeology of childhood has basically demonstrated that none of this is true. <laughs> so really the foundations of the archaeology of childhood, which started in 1989 with a really important article by a Norwegian archaeologist named Greta Lillehammer, where she introduced us to the child's world, basically was a survey of Scandinavian archaeology, and she showed that you could find children in every single type of archaeological evidence that archaeologists study all the time anyway. We were just choosing to not find the children. And we'll look at some of the ways that that has been reversed. Um, but we will go through all of these things. The fact that children are producers of material culture. I'm going to put, point out more than once that children are at least a third, if not more than half, of every documented culture that has ever been documented through um, censuses, through um, hunter-gatherer and early forager and early ethnographic life tables children are a huge portion of the population. So we're ignoring somebody or a group of somebody that's really big and significant. And also the things that children do, right? So we're gonna look at some of these kind of things. And I just have to say, that's my nephew who just turned 12 and he's always really stoked. And this is appropriate. I've gotten so much feedback from people for having a New England Patriot shirt on a child in this presentation as I presented it around the country. So maybe there will be some love for the Tom Brady jersey on my nephew uh, when he was just a couple of years old um, way back in 2012 when we were in the dynasty years. So there you go. Um, and this really, I think, helps tie us into the theme that was trying to be created for this year's speaker series, which was to really start to think about how archaeology is pushing boundaries towards a different kind of interpreting the past. And I would say that one of the things that the archaeology of childhood does is it helps push archaeology towards studying people and thinking about the complexity of the human communities that made the archaeological record rather than just a default undescribed human actor who most people realize was also an adult male. So there's an age and gender component to what the default is. The archaeology of childhood is really pushing this. And you can say, well, why does that matter? Here we go. Um, these are two pretty recent examples um, of interpretations of archaeology um, that are problematic for a lot of reasons. On the left, we have the Happisburg footprint site from 2014. So for those of you who might be familiar, you can Google this site. It was a really big find um, because sea levels had dropped and they found all of these footprints along the seacoast in what is now England. Now, the press reported this as a British family out for a stroll. It wasn't Britain then. Um, and they, you can see how the artist reconstructed this in a way that reinforces contemporary ideas of an of a family. You have the woman, the one woman is sitting here holding a child up by its head. I'm not sure how that's helping it, but that's what she's doing. Um, this child is doing, I don't know what, right? There's sort of a nondescript action, but you see here, there's one of the males is defending the group, presumably from one of these extraordinarily tame wild animals. And you have the other males in the foreground butchering and feeding the group. That really reinforces some stereotypes about what children, women, and men are, are capable of and are doing by projecting it into the past. 
This is from last year from the Smithsonian's Human Origins webpage. And here we have a social group that you would know of a study of hunter gatherers is about the size of an entire small band that would have been moving around independently on a landscape. But this group isn't going to live very long, whether they're a monastic community or something else is going on, they're all men. So you have an entire population building a building where there are no children, there are no women, there are no actors, there are, it, there are no people. Uh, there's no complexity. So the archaeology of childhood is really an important part of this movement in archaeology to say we need to do a better job figuring out who did what. It's not enough to say what was done, but who did it? How can we look at these uh, more complex ideas about human communities? So the final thing that I want to point out is while I point out we all have um, experiences of childhood and all humans have had experiences of childhood and it's important for us to recognize that we also can't project into the past what a child or what childhood is because cultures vary in their ideas about children over time and over space. And this means that the idea of child is something that is defined culturally. It's generally defined relationally, which means when you're defining what a child is or who a child is, you're also defining who they are not. They're not an infant, they're not a toddler, they're not a teenager, they're not an adult. And we have boundaries for all of these different categories of personhood that we monitor pretty closely in our own culture and that cultures monitor, sometimes through rites of passage, sometimes through allowances or affordances or expectations. And we can talk more about that if any of you have a question, if you want this explained further. But one of the things I will say, and I put it in bold, is one of the jobs of the archeologists archae is to to try to not project their childhood into the past, but instead to try to figure out the different definitions and meanings um, and categories of people who were present at different archeological sites. And childhood studies are interested mostly in age, but there are lots of ways you could do that. So let's spend the rest of our time together here in a whirlwind tour of what archeologists have learned by studying childhood. So I've made the case for why we should have demonstrated there's now a pretty big consensus that this is a good idea. And we've moved from wondering about children and having to prove that they were there um, to this kind of, I love this quote by Anders Hoberg. It's actually really a boring idea. It's banal that there were children in the past. Of course there were, or we would be like those men on the Smithsonian website who wouldn't be here in the future. So we know that there are, there are these dynamics to human communities and we need to assume that as a starting point. So what do we learn? Well, one of the things that has changed with the archaeology of childhood is how people have addressed skeletal remains, mortuary archaeology, and burial practices surrounding children. In more traditional times in archaeology, children really were used for two things. Um, their skeletal health and well-being were often seen as like the canary in the coal mine. If the children aren't doing well and the population isn't feeding their children, chances are the population is under stress. A population whose children, even the ones that are dying, show pretty good indicators of health and well-being. It suggests that there's something going on successful with the population, and this was a different reason for mortality, um, which is interesting because that suggests children are important to people even though they didn't study them, <laughs> right? The irony, so there we go. But then the other thing that people did is that children were the indicator of status. So if you found a child's grave that had lots of burial goods, then you assumed that they had a, a status that had been given to them at birth. They were born into a family of status. Whereas if the children had no grave goods in a particular burial assemblage and the adults had a lot, you assumed you had to earn your status over your lifetime. And this was really how children were talked about. Now, bioarchaeology, which is the study of human skeletal remains in archeological contexts, have been doing a lot of work on how do you take an individual skeleton and try to figure out the cultural categories that might have been associated with those identities. It's a very complicated process, but how do human bodies come to have cultural meaning at different ages is a big question. We also still want to know about health and well being because that's an important part of understanding societies, but also learning about things like care and love 
love? How can we see relationships that are intangible and meaningful through the ritual treatment of human skeletal remains, particularly in the treatment of children? And some of the work that's been done on the bioarchaeology of care and the bioarchaeology of families and communities is really a very beautiful study on moving from skeletons to some really intangible elements of human communities that we can think harder about because of this archaeological evidence. Another thing that archaeologists have looked at is toys um, and also how to find children without them. Because one of the ongoing problems um, as the archaeology of childhood is trying to push into archaeology more broadly is there's an association between children and toys. And in a lot of the early scholarship, toys were really important. This was my own early work as well, because you you I pointed out and others pointed out that children were visible, that children used the material record in patterned ways, in ways that we can interpret. But then what has happened is people have said, well, we found a toy, so we have children, or there are no toys, so there were no children. Well, that's not really good. <laughs> the question is, how do we find children at every archaeological site because we know they were most likely there? And so archaeologists have started thinking more and more about the way that adults and children related to the material landscapes and objects that are encountered in archaeological sites. And I use this contemporary example here. Um, there are no toys on the table, but there are two children at the table. They're eating. They're using the material culture of a household. So thinking about how um, different spaces, places, objects enabled adults and children to negotiate the material world and their relationships with one another has become really important. And I'll give you a quick example um, from the Maya site of Chinchuk Mill, which was work done by Scott Hudson, who's at the University of Kentucky, a really brilliant archaeologist. Um, and he looked at this site that was a multi-generational site that contained phases of buildings, some of which were older, some of which were more recent. And all of the older buildings um, revealed the practice, the Maya practice of having cleaned the house before abandoning it. It's very common seen archaeologically. You can still see it in Maya homes today. If you're going to leave a house, you, you clean the front, you clean everything out. Through excavating the floor deposits here, he was able to find that, that sort of windblown sediment that you would expect that occurs after abandonment, dirt that didn't wasn't carried in, it's too heavy, it drifted in, and it was covering these little deposits in a lot of these buildings that had things like shells and kind of cool colored rocks and pottery with interesting pictures. And they were in these little clusters in the corner. And he was like, I don't have toys, but I certainly have children. Look at them. They're here. They're playing in these abandoned buildings. They're using these spaces. They get out of the eyesight of their parents. They're enjoying and, and adults. They're having some private playtime. Um, and he also talks about how through this, they learned how Maya buildings were constructed, how they could have been used, what was new, what was old. And that was knowledge they would carry into their own adulthood. So that's something to think about too, is that all of these adults we see at archeological sites were also experiencing them as children, um, which is important to think about, although harder. Um, so here is, um, Another nice example of what archaeologists have been working on with children is that they look at children learning. And ethnographic research shows that most children's learning is an informal process. It's not the kind of education we have now. It's done by things like observation or experience or seeing somebody do something and mimicking it. So one of the things that ethnographic research has also showed us is things like Children are often, if we look at this picture on the left, so this is a recent 21st century picture of a child in Southern Thailand that was given to me by a wonderful cultural anthropologist um, that he had also given to David Lancey for his article called Kids with Knives that looked at children around the world that are regularly given objects that we see as dangerous. And the idea is they're gonna test it out. They're gonna learn the object is dangerous. Um, they're gonna sometimes offer to mimic what adults are doing and the adults say yes, and they're gonna learn by doing in trial and error. Um, and you can see on the right, sort of a prehistoric example of observation. So these kinds of learning where children are in unstructured environments be giving opportunities are really important. A lot of people have also used this final concept I mentioned here, legitimate peripheral preparation, uh, participation or LPP. Um, which is how can children participate in crafting communities, in artistic communities, um, without making stuff? So what might be opportunities?
opportunities for them to be valuable and be doing things that are useful and learning by being. And you can see the long list there for lithics. Um, more importantly, though, is that there is a lot of evidence for children learning that, that is also direct. And we can see these things archaeologically. So I'm only going to use one uh, example here, which is from ceramics. Um, but the same is also um, noted for lithics. So there are systematic errors that novice learners make when making stone tools that you can find in an archaeological assemblage. Um, and I will say that, that we have this same thing with ceramics. So there's two things that I want to show you here. One of these is a chart. This was made by Sue Langdon. She was studying Greek pottery and similar work has been done for um, the southwestern United States and other regions that have largely decorative painted sort of um, varieties of ceramics. Langdon found that you could distinctly see differences between works where skilled potters were creating works and creating the art and where children were painting the art and, and creating the works. And I will say here, um, people will say, well, adults learn. Y'all are in a lecture today, <laughs> so adults still learn. But it is considered that given um, a lot of lifespans and sort of not so much the entire lifespan, but the movement from childhood to adulthood and having your own household is much smaller in most ethnographic communities, right? We've expanded childhood quite a bit in contemporary society. Um, and learning these things takes a lot of time. So most learners are thought to have been children. A lot of titles say like about 80%, 75%, some say 90% of the learning we see in the archeological record is probably attributable to children because of when people would have had to learn things to maintain in their own household. So that's where the distinction is being made. So Langdon has this one set of tables that shows us some things that you can see. She also found one of the things I found that was fascinating is that children's vessels in ancient Greece were painted upside down because the children couldn't hold the pot on the smaller bottom and actually do the art. They flipped it over so that it would sit on the rim, which reminds me of me at like summer camp. You had to have a steady base so that you could actually manipulate it. So everything is painted in a really distinctively childlike way. Um, but the other example, these are from the um, late woodland period of Ontario. This is uh, the work of Steve Dorland, who's at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. And he has shown that you can see children's learning even without painted art. So up here on the top, there's a lot of things I could point out, um, the irregularity of these sizes and things like that. But look at these adorable, these are little kids' fingernail marks. And most potters would have made the fingernail mark when making the incision, but they would have cleaned it up. So this is a sort of a novice decorative mistake. There's also examples here, and you can see it here, where the pots are made incorrectly. So they're tempered, they're, they're adding things to clay, which if done correctly, stabilizes the clay and allows you to fire it more successfully. If you're not successful at that, the pot explodes. So you can see both decorative and also manufacturing issues with these vessels. Um, so we can see learning. I also want to say that we can see children doing work that is important. So it's not just the work of learning, but it's making real contributions. So on the left, this is a shell midden. They are all over the world. Coastal communities throughout prehistory and in history have made piles of shells because you can't eat them. You can only eat what's inside and you throw the trash all in one place and this is what you get. Um, Doug Bird and Rebecca, Rebecca Blige Bird did an ethnographic study or an ethno-archaeological study in the Torres Strait region of Australia, where there's still a lot of shellfish foraging. And they analyzed archaeologically the breakdown of shells in a shell bin like this and looked at the different habitats where those different shellfish came from. And they then observed foraging patterns. And what they found is that children were foraging independently of adults, that they were feeding themselves a large portion of their diet. And anybody who has kids thinks, well, that's a huge contribution. If they could feed themselves, that would be amazing. So the kids are foraging and eating as they go along, but they're also contributing these resources to the entire group. And they're resources that only children can access because of their smaller size, 
and they're smaller stature and they can reach between rocks and get these particular species of shellfish that are inaccessible to adults. And so they're contributing to the overall dietary breadth of a population that's foraging. That's not an inconsequential contribution on the part of children and it's one that's visible archeologically. Um, the other example here on the right is from a site you may have heard of. It's called Stonehenge, it's in England. Um, and this is a Bronze Age dagger from an elite burial. And what you can see here is um, these are the tips. This is a heavily magnified picture of the bronze. Uh, it appears in several places, these little bronze strands that are a part of the decoration. And this was in a, um, a museum associated with Stonehenge for a while. And one of the curators finally contacted several ophthalmologists and said, these things are two millimeters a piece. So if you wanna know what that's like, pull a hair out of your head and take a peek. And it's only slightly bigger than that. These are thin, thin strands of, of bronze. And they said, there were no magnifying glasses. There were no eyeglasses. Who was doing this work? And all of the eye doctors agreed. The only people who could do this work was young children. Um, and so this is a really interesting example of children doing a very specific craft that was highly valued by some of the most elite members of a Bronze Age society. So while the foraging might be every day and helping your family, this is crafting at a very high level for a very important segment of your society. Um, interestingly enough too, the optometrists and ophthalmologists all said that the children who had done this work would have damaged their eyes so severely, they would have required care in later life. So that's an interesting statement to how this work was valued and how the people performing it would have had to have been cared for by the community as they aged. Um, I have a couple more examples before we wrap up. Um, these are finger flutings from caves. Um, these are, caves have soft sediment in the walls and these are traces of human handprints from the upper Paleolithic. The published dates for these um, go back to almost 20,000 years. Um, I also know that there are some potentially uh, older dates available for some of these that are, have not been published. So, but think of these as 20,000 year old pieces of art um, or 20,000 year old traces of human activity. Um, the initial work with these caves was done in Australia, France and Spain, where it's continuing. It was done by Kevin Sharp and his wife, Leslie Van Gelder. Kevin has died, Dr. Van Gelder and Dr. April Noel, who just wrote a very great book on growing up in the ice age on children in the Paleolithic. Um, have taken this work on. And what's really cool about these handprints, and I, I didn't realize this, they, they were able to create using existing populations and all kinds of biological measurements. They could figure out the ages and the genders of the people who were, or sexes, sorry, of people who were um, making these finger flutings. So um, you can see adults and children engaging and interacting. Here um, are some adult fingerprints. You can see the thickness. You can see some children's fingerprints here, and you can see two more adult figure uh, fingerprints crossing um, in this particular image. You can also then probably start to see some differences in fingerprint size um, in this other work to the left. So you can see the interactiveness. Now these were made in totally dark caves. So somebody's holding a light and the families or the individuals in a social group were all drawing together and making these marks together. Some of them are, are incredibly lovely. Uh, Dr. Van Gelder told me once about one that's in a cave in France where you can see a mother's hand trailing. She's just, she's walking along the side wall of the cave and she turns a corner and you can see her hand move. And up above her, probably because the child's in a cradle board is a child who can't be because of the finger size is teeny, teeny, tiny. And this tiny little fingerprint is along the wall above that of their parent. So that's really charming. But what I wanted to point out is this is really cool because we like looking at direct traces of people. We love footprints and handprints and stuff. It's just, it's human to do that, right? Like, whoa, there they are. Um, the people who explored the caves in the greatest range went to the most places and have created the most of these finger flutings are children. And they're often done independently of adults. So the tiny little nooks and crannies of caves, um, you find these flutings of children in single, it, you know, like elementary school age kids, single digits. 
kindergarten, first grade. Um, so somebody is holding a light for them to explore or they're taking a light and they're being allowed to explore. But we can see that the greatest cave explorers of the upper Paleolithic as demonstrated by finger flutings are the children, which is really cool. We can also see children in other forms of art. And this is sort of um, one of the last points that I wanna make is that in cultures that have existing artistic traditions that we're able to sort of study in mass. And there's not lots of them, but we can see them here. There's Egypt, there's Greece, there's Rome. Uh, these are the Aztec codices. So there's all kinds of depictions. Um, we regularly see depictions of children. And you can see them in everyday interactions, like here's a child and a piece of associated material culture sitting in a high chair. Um, you can see rituals involving children. We can see rites of passage and individuals getting new clothing and new objects as they progress through the life cycle. So there's a lot of things that we can see. It's also becomes clear, not only can we then through these images associate children with other types of identity like gender, class, age-based categories of identity, lots of complex ways of understanding them as people. Um, we also know that children come to symbolize really important things in different societies. So if you get the chance and you ever wanna wander around a cemetery, there are so many wonderful ones to wander around in Massachusetts and surrounding states. Um, you will find, for example, that one of the images that's on headstones to this day, but starting in the 19th century, um, are lambs and they're only used for children and it's a symbol of their innocence and of their purity and sort of of the sacrifice of having lost a child right the sort of the lamb is symbolic of all of those things so artistically we start to see how children take on important meanings and value systems for different cultures in different times so that is a crazy fast overview, um, but I want to leave you with a few kind of things that I would say if I'm going to be as even more evangelical than I have already sounded about this particular topic that has been central to a lot of my work in archaeology over the years, is that there's a lot of reasons we should want to study childhood as archaeologists, that some type of childhood is a universal experience, so we should be doing cross-cultural research across time and space to try to learn more about what it means to be human and its diversity and its similarities. Um, studying people is good for archaeology. It's a mess. <laughs> if you try to do this, it's harder, but it requires greater rigor. So trying to think of a more complicated human-filled past is not the easy way out. It's not fluffy. It's not easy. It's really trying to look harder at that material record and say, can I find people of different ages doing things that are important and making contributions? Now, the answer is yes, you can, but you have to find new ways to look at the archaeological record to do that. The other thing that I think, well, and then the final point I make is the demographic one, which is absolutely there. Children are everywhere and they're super important into how human communities structure their lives. But the final thing I would say is that adults and children are always negotiating cultural ideas, intergenerational ideas of how to be and what to do um, and how to use things and how to be in the world change over time. And archaeologists tend to want to know about change over time. It's our big picture story, but we tend to look at big picture causes. Ooh, now there's agriculture. Ooh, now we're controlling water. Ooh, now there's this. Now there's this. But so much change in our society is small and interpersonal and on these family and community levels where people are negotiating new ways and new ideas and how to do things differently and looking at age-based categories and how we can see them interacting archaeologically to me offers another way to think about why cultures stay the same or why they, they change, which is the big question, right? That's, how, that's the big question. How did we get here? So if you are interested, this is my shameless self-promotion slide. Um, I left out the part of the talk that is about childhood in the 19th century, which is what I do. But I've written a lot about American childhood in my university press, a Florida book from 2009. Um, and the second edition of the Archaeology of Childhood, which is all of the cases I talked about are in more detail in that book, um, comes out in 2022, just two months from now. Um, the original came out in 2005, and this new edition is over 150 pages longer and contains over three times the sources. So that's how big this has become as a field, which is a really um, privileged thing for me to have been able to see as a scholar who's been here from the get-go. 
Um, and with that, both child Jane and adult Jane are happy to take questions that you might have. Um, and so with that, I will stop my screen share and um, see if anybody has some questions for me. Yeah, so please uh, put questions into the Q&A or the chat function and I will read them uh, to our speaker. Um, before we get to that, I do wanna say two things. First, the um, your comment about uh, child gravestones with the little lamb. The first yeah. time I ever saw one of those and realized what it meant, was in the first congressional church in Gardner, Massachusetts, hey, walking <laughs> on the way to the Blue Moon Diner and everything. <laughs> I think this gives everyone a flavor of what our conversation was like before the talk started. I started all pepped up because we were talking like this about our shared landscapes of childhood, actually. Exactly. And the other thing I will say as um, one of the things I always think about with like childhood or different things is, um, in my study of history and archaeology, you always come up with like ancient societies that, you know, different ways to get rid of like lice and stuff, right? And a lot will use mm -hmm. urine because it's like, you know, acidic and everything. And growing up with brothers, I'm always like, which, you know, two boys, the older one peed on the other one's head or something, right? Oh, like, God, how did we learn so many of these things through you know, again, I grew up with brothers through stupid things kids do that you're like, oh, yeah. wait, right? Yeah, no, I mean, there, there's a lot of, I mean, not only that anecdote, but children experience the world without inferential reasoning, yeah. right? Until they're about 11. So if you haven't done it, you don't know how to do it. Like, and that's in, true from getting from point A to point B yep. or how to do this or that. It's So it's a really, your brain changes a lot at 11, apparently. But the point is, yeah there's no filter like you see something and you're like well I'll try that um so I love that um general idea of children as as innovators right, right? It's really fantastic because they don't have the same boundaries and they aren't as bounded by the rules that they're still learning as adults yep. yeah absolutely I love that um okay so one of our questions is um what is the most interesting uh, thing have you found related to children in your research or unexpected probably too? Wow. Um, I don't know if thing is object or thing is idea. So um, sure. dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. Um, I, I think my favorite piece of work that I've done on children. So the thing that I found out about children was an interdisciplinary piece on um, how children learned to learn about death because in 1850 more than one in five infants died and over 30 percent of deaths were people under 18 so there was a lot of literature on teaching your children how to die um, and there were lots of conventions like doll play and children's books and stories and i think that that fundamentally transformed my way of thinking about children all the way back through prehistory is you know we take for granted i mean right now the it, the odds of an infant dying is um infinitesimal like to use the word i suppose that's really wrong but there it is like it's tiny it's not one in five it's like less than six in a thousand, five in a thousand. So it's really rare. And that's what we've I've grown up thinking. And it was very hard for me to think in the past about what that must have been like, not just for adults in terms of loss, but children. And in that you don't have to go back very far to learn about how like you were supposed to take your children to the cemetery so they could pick out a headstone so you'd know what they liked if they died. That's that's a really fundamental like talk about like sort of changing your whole mindset so in terms of something that really transformed the way I thought about the past and archaeology generally that that was really um important I will say in general I don't have a favorite single object but one of the things is that children's artifacts tend to be found if you find toys um and again you don't have to but if you find toys um they're a very small part of any archaeological assemblage. So if you dig up any house site or any, anything, less than 1% of the artifacts are going to be toys anyway, which is why they're not a great tool if you want to use those as the identifier of children. But when you do find them, they're so intensely personal, right? Like, I mean, I think archaeologists, like finding another dish or another brick is not the big excitement on an archaeological site. It's finding the thing that somebody probably treasured 
and spent time with and really meant something to them. And doing the archeology span of childhood, you encounter those artifacts all the time because of their rarity. And I think we all have a sense from our childhoods that the things that mattered to us really mattered to us. They shaped very small worlds. Um, and so that's a beautiful thing to experience too archaeologically. So that's a generic response. Sorry. Hey, it's good. I will say, thinking of like my brother's house with my nephews, if an archaeologist dug it right now, it is not 1% of their material no. culture is toys now. You know, it's like yeah. everywhere. Contemporary <laughs> scholars talk a lot about what they call sacrificial spending. Um, when they talk about childhood is that you'll see parents regularly underspend on themselves and then overspend on their children. Um, it's a very common practice across socioeconomic, yes. the socioeconomic spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the amount I, of Legos we have. Yeah, um, it's, it's a very dangerous obstacle course if you have a house with nephews around for sure. Right? Yeah. And I will say like archaeologists in the future, who's the first one who like steps on one of those or whatever, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, we have another question that is related, sort of a two-parter. So however yeah. you want to do it is... Um, one is how has the field of archaeology changed since you started in accepting, you know, looking at children and how do you have any like recommendations for other sort of um, groups in archaeology outside of academia? So I'm probably I think they're thinking like CRM or things like that, including childhood archaeology yeah. into what they might be doing. Yeah, I, I mean, I can say that that CRM is sort of where I've worked in CRM for a while too. I've, I've had a career in, in different sectors of archaeology and, and landed in academia ultimately, but um, CRM is one of those things that's the classic, the children get a little page, a little section of the toys, and then that's it. Um, and so I think, in and, and that's accurate reporting, and that's, that's fair enough, um, but it, I think, all archaeology should be challenged to think about a past that is populated by people and the implications of that. And like I said, I think children push the boundaries of that. Um, the, the first question, the first part of the question is how has archaeology changed, which is a very polite way of saying that they realize I'm old, thanks. Uh, yeah, but, but um, which is true. Um, but when, so how has archaeology changed? When I was doing archaeology in graduate school in the 1990s, um, was a very specific kind of moment in archaeological theory and thinking. So for years, the predominant way of thinking about archaeology was considered, it was called processual archaeology, it was the dominant theoretical way of thinking, and it emphasized science, and it emphasized um, trying to make archaeology as close as you could to the natural sciences and using that as a way to try to figure out universals of human behavior. Um, and in the 1990s was a time when that was heavily under critique. The fact that humans do not behave in law-like ways. All you have to do is, I mean, go spend some time on the internet and you will know right away that it is a fool's errand to try to find scientific laws that govern all the things that we're doing. But what didn't happen from those critiques, the post-processual critiques that were being laid on, um, was what to do instead. So it was really a criticism without a constructivism. And that kind of leaves you nowhere. You know, if, if we can't do this, then you aren't going to tell us what else we should be doing. Where does archaeology need to go? And um, I would say, I think that archaeology now has reconciled a lot of that and that archaeology is moving ever more in a direction that is seeking a more human past, one that looks at the diversity of cultural actors who thinks about people as the, in the past, not just as producers of artifacts, but as true human subjects, that it should be our goal to try to understand them um, as best we can, recognizing that a lot of intangible parts of culture, I can't understand what my husband thinks but we live together all the time, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's really, to say you can understand what another person's internal world is, is really, you can get close, but I mean, you know, so the idea that we don't do it that well in living communities and even in intimate relationships, it's really a, a heavy load for archeologists to think about doing in the past, but we should try. And so archeology span has, I think, um, 
is moving to a place that appreciates the incredible rigor um, that came from processional archaeology in terms of how we have to record data, analyze data, develop methods to try to extract as much information as we can from our data, be open to innovation. Um, but then at the same time, to create theoretical models that first and foremost look at people and, and to try to get this human story from these, these artifacts. So that's really how it has changed. And it is allowed, I think, a space, I think, the archaeology of childhood, I don't know if we've been a driving force in this, this group of people who have been doing this, but we certainly have been on the among many who have been pushing into these spaces um, and saying, let's try to find ways to do this that are constructive, that we can actually say something with some certainty um, that is a little more satisfying. So that's love it. That. Yeah. And any archaeologist can do that. That's a yeah. choice and how you want to approach the archaeological record. Well, like you say, until I had started reading your stuff, it was like one of those where you're like, oh, like it was such, so obvious. Like I hadn't seen it kind of thing, right? And you're just like, oh my God, yes. So. Yeah, it's, no, it, it really, there's no going back. <laughs> it's like, you can't go back. It's not satisfying. Right? No, it's totally. Well, and I, and cause it's one of the things I talk with my students about how like, we might have like one, you know, type of, like one example of some flint napping thing, right? And we can base a whole culture on that, mm -hmm. essentially. And it could be like someone's first attempt, you know? Yeah. Right? Like, we're like, oh, they weren't that technologically, whatever. And, you know, if you go back in time, it's like some five year old doing their first flint napping, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, those were the questions we had for okay. you today. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Baxter, um, and thank you to our viewers for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which will be on Wednesday, May 18th. And we're gonna go international for that one when we're uh, joined by Dr. Theodora Muticio. I have to figure out how to pronounce her last name. Um, and she's gonna be joining us all the way from Greece to speak about the archeology span of the Mediterranean. So um, again, we rely on support of viewers like you. So consider supporting our outreach by becoming a member of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And we always love having, you know, Massachusetts and Gardner people coming okay. to talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It was great. You've had an incredible lineup of speakers. I feel really honored to have been a part of them this season. Thanks. Well, thank you. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>